-hmm. Psalm 14, beginning in verse 1, reading through verse 4. And the Word of God today reads in this fashion. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge? Who eat up my people as they eat bread and call not upon the Lord? Hallelujah. Psalm chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic. Don't be a fool. Amen. If you'll bow your heads with me a moment. Master, once again, O oh God, we are grateful to you for the opportunity to be in the house of the Lord. We're grateful, God, that you've allowed us this morning to wake up with life and breath in our being. You've allowed us today, O oh God, to come into a place where we might fellowship one with another, whether it be by reason of the internet, whether it be physically, but where we're able to fellowship with one another, to commune both with one another as well as with your spirit. We're able to hear the preached word of God, which is powerful and life-changing. And Master, today the man of God needs the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Lord, how I need to be anointed of the Holy Ghost if the word I would preach is to be beneficial if it is to be received by those that would hear it. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would loose right now in the presence of your people the power of God. Let the word of God go forth like a mighty hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. O oh, Master, today, anoint the preacher, anoint the ears of those that hear for we ask it in none other than Jesus' precious, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Don't be a fool. You've seen people acting up sometimes and they're just acting like they haven't got any sense and they're acting like, uh, you know, they have just thrown all caution and intellect to, to the side and they're clowning around and goofing around and someone will say to them, hey, don't act foolish, don't be a fool. I'm going to tell you, you tell somebody don't act foolish, you're suggesting to them that they are in fact playing the fool. They're acting the part of a fool. Am I telling the truth? You tell somebody don't be a jackass, you're telling them they're acting like a jackass. Am I telling the truth? Amen. You say to somebody don't act like a fool, you're telling them that they are behaving as a fool. They appear to be a fool by reason of their conduct. Well, I'm here to tell you today, the Word of God instructs us that there are a number of occasions in which human beings play the part of a fool, or they act the part of a fool. And I want to share them with you this afternoon. First and foremost, as we have read in our primary text today, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Humanity is arguably the most intelligent and evolved, as it were, species known to planet Earth. Yet for millennium, 
There has not existed a single civilization that has not demonstrated some concept of faith or some concept of an understanding of things spiritual and a belief in God. When you uh, are someone who works in the field of digging up ancient cultures, you go back in time uh, by removing dirt and finding various artifacts and you find cultures uh, from time gone by and uh, some of these cultures are hundreds of years old some of them are thousands of years old one of the first things that an anthropologist will begin to look for is their religion because without fail, every society, my God, you go back to the most so-called ignorant and unlearned of societies on our planet. You go today to the deepest woods of Africa. You go to the deepest, darkest corner of New Guinea. And you will find tribes of people who may not have our education system, they may not have our intellect, they may not have our technology, but honey, they've got something in common with us as part of the human race. They have a concept of God. Doesn't mean their concept is right. It just means that somewhere in human DNA, there is a built-in acknowledgement of God. God literally designed us in this fashion. This way, faith and finding Him would not be entirely difficult because somewhere in the back of our mind, somewhere in the back of our spirit, there is an acknowledgement that human beings consist of more than just flesh and blood. Our existence is more than just what we do, where we go, what we own, what we wear. There has to be more to human existence than this. There is a spiritual realm. There is an invisible realm that is, that is very much a part of us and that we are very much a part of that we pass into once we have exited this life and once we have given up our bodies and left this old flesh and blood form behind, there is a spiritual existence. Yes, I see. There is a spiritual existence that we are part of. Amen. And that is a part of us. want to tell you today, my friend, don't be a fool. The fool hath said in his heart that there is no God. In Hebrews 11, 3 and verse 6 as well, the Word of God said, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. I want to tell you, those of you who insist upon uh, accepting scientific explanations and you insist upon you know you're afraid that someone's going to call you ignorant you're afraid someone's going to call you foolish because you say i believe god created well i got news for you honey i believe god created the heavens and the earth hallelujah and i will declare that i will say that unashamed and unafraid because it is not science that I make this declaration. It is through faith that I make this declaration. Now how God went about doing that, how God went about causing something to uh, arise from nothing, I don't understand it. I don't know it. I don't have all the answers. I will one day. Hallelujah. One day the word of God said, for now we see through a glass darkly but then shall we see face to face 
Oh, I'm going to tell you, the day is coming when all the mysteries of the earth, all the mysteries of creation, all the mysteries of the world in which we live are going to be made known to us. But for now, by faith and through faith, I believe that God created the heavens and the earth. Hallelujah. I don't need science to confirm it. And if right. science appears to contradict it, that's all well and good. Because my, my confidence is not established in science. My confidence is established by faith. The Word of God said, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear, meaning things which are seen were made out of things which were not seen. Verse number 6 declares, but without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God, listen, must believe that he is. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. I'm going to tell you something. I don't, I don't fault people today who believe in other faith systems. Now, do not misunderstand me. I'm not saying I believe those faith systems to be true. I am not saying I believe those faith systems are all on equal footing with the message of Jesus Christ because I do not believe that, to be frank. I believe Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But I appreciate people who are uh, Hindus. I appreciate people who are Muslims. I appreciate people who belong to other uh, faith groups and other religions. Why do I say that? A pastor, you're an apostolic pastor. You're not supposed to utter those words. Um, let me tell you something. They're never going to find where I'm at unless they first have been where they're at now. Because without faith, it is impossible to please Him. In order to come to God, we first must believe that He he is somewhere in those people there is that little ounce of faith there is that little ounce of acknowledgement that God exists I'm going to tell you that's the first leg in a long journey hello man right. amen that's the first leg in a long journey they say you know that uh, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Well, the journey to the full revelation and understanding of Jesus Christ and obedience to His gospel, it also begins with one step. And that step is we must first believe that God is. Secondly, and this is something that unfortunately too many Christian churches don't bother preaching because it doesn't uh, work the fear they want to work and the intimidation they want to use. But that he is also a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You go to many churches today and they spend more time focusing on God being a punisher, listen to me now, being a punisher of those who don't seek him and they never bother to tell you that God is pleased and happy with those who do. Hallelujah. True. He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. The Word of God says today, Draw nigh unto God, and He will draw nigh unto you. Resist the devil, and He will flee from you. I'm going to tell you something, children. For those of you today in the LGBT community, and I've met many over the years, I've had people come into churches, affirming churches that I was pastoring had a lady come in one time to our church in Connecticut that I was trying to work and build. And this woman came in and 
She said, I've been trying to get up the nerve to come and visit for months. She said, I've really been struggling with it. She said, I've been terrified that if I walked into this building, that the building would collapse on me or that God would strike me dead. She was so full of fear because of the message preached at her by other preachers in other churches. She said, I was terrified the building would fall in on me. I said, honey, the word of God says that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The word of God says that if we draw nigh unto God, he'll draw nigh unto you. I'm going to tell you a little secret, and oh my goodness, I'm going to get myself in a lot of trouble today. I absolutely disagree with 90% or better of Roman Catholic teaching, but honey, if that's where you start your journey, at least you made one tiptoe in the right direction. Right. I don't agree today with Baptist teaching. I don't agree with a lot of Methodist teaching. I don't agree with a lot of Presbyterian teaching, but if that's where you're starting your journey, it's all good. I'm going to tell you, most of us don't start our journey in the same place that our journey ends. Amen. We receive revelation. The Word of God declares that God gives to men according to their ability to receive. If all you can handle right now is the concept of faith in Jesus Christ, if that's all you can wrap your mind around because you have very little knowledge of the Word of God, you haven't been exposed much to the Word of God, you haven't uh, spent a lot of time exploring or studying the Word of God. If that's all you can wrap your mind around, God understands that. And He may start you out in a Baptist church. He may start you out in a Presbyterian. I'm going to tell you, the church I grew up in was not a one God, Jesus name, apostolic, Pentecostal uh, church. But it started me in the right direction. Oh, I'm going to tell you, it started me in the right direction. If there's anything I took away from my growing up in a fundamentalist Pentecostal church, I come away with a conviction that the Word of God is true, that it is reliable, that I can trust what it says. Hallelujah. And I'm going to tell you, because of that conviction that I established in a non-truth church, shall we use that phrase. Because of that conviction, Tommy, I was one day able to come into the fullness of the truth of God. Hallelujah. I was able one day to open the Word of God and read as the Holy Ghost revealed to me and showed me that there is one God in Christ and Jesus is his name. Hallelujah. I was able to understand Jesus' name, baptism. I was able to understand the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are one and the same. They are three manifestations of one and the same God. Mm -hmm. Not three persons. But if it wasn't for the conviction that was instilled in me growing up in a church that did not preach this message. I might not ever have been in a place to receive this message. That's right. I have my grandmother, my mother's mother, she started out born and raised I mean, drenched in Roman Catholicism. My great-grandmother was drenched from her birth in Roman Catholicism. But one day, my grandmother attended a Baptist church, and they told her that she needed to put her faith not in the rituals and not in the tradition and not in the teachings of Roman Catholicism, but she needed to put her faith alone in Jesus Christ. And at that moment in her life, that's probably all she could handle hearing. And she did. She started her journey. As time went on, 
somebody somewhere come to her and said, Oh, Eleanor, there's more. Hallelujah. God fills with the Holy Ghost. God baptizes with the Holy Ghost. God puts His Spirit in you. And you're filled with power. You're filled with love. You're filled with joy. You're filled with peace. You're filled with things that you're going to need if you're going to make it through this life victoriously. My grandmother received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And my little great-grandmother also, born and raised in Portuguese, mind you, born and raised, I mean, steep like a tea bag in Roman Catholicism. My little great-grandmother came to that Pentecostal church. And my little great-grandmother heard the message of salvation. She heard the message of the infilling of the Holy Ghost. And don't ask me why she thought she was testing God I guess but she tells us that she asked God in Portuguese Lord if this Holy Ghost thing is real if this thing is real then fill me with the Holy Ghost but she decided to ask him in Portuguese I don't know why she thought that well guess what God understands Portuguese hallelujah he filled her with the Holy Ghost and that little woman began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God give her the utterance because it is real. But see, her journey started in Catholicism. That's all right. That's okay. Just don't get stuck in the mud, folks. God isn't looking for people who are willing to stand still and say, well, bless God, I was born here, I'll die here. That's what we call an unprofitable servant. That's what we call a servant who the Word of God describes, Jesus described in a parable, as one who was given one coin. And he went and buried that one coin so when his master returned, he could come back and say, Here, here's the one coin you gave me. I'm giving it back to you. God doesn't expect you to give him back what he gave you in the beginning. He expects you to invest it. He expects you to find more. He expects you to utilize what he's given you to attain more. You should wind up in a place of more revelation. You should wind up in a place of greater spiritual understanding and a greater knowledge of the word of God and a greater understanding of who Jesus is as your walk with God continues then your knowledge and your revelation should grow and multiply as well if it's not there is something wrong folks my little great aunt she's in her 90s now been in the United Pentecostal Church thank God for good Lord 70 years roughly my uncle met her during World War II. My uncle brought her over to the United States of America so he could marry her. She'd come over. She followed the same path that my grandmother Bell did. She also had background in Catholicism. She followed the same path my grandma Bell did. She began to attend the Baptist church. I can't trust Roman Catholic tradition. I can't trust Roman Catholic dogma. It's not about the sacraments. Nowhere in the Word of God are the sacraments taught as having any part to play in our salvation whatsoever. And work certainly has nothing to do with salvation. I can't work my way in. I can't pray my way in. I can't pay my way in. All I can do is believe on Jesus. Well, the Baptist church told her that. And she understood that. That's all she understood at the moment. She'd visit my grandmother's Pentecostal church once in a while. And she said, I got to tell you. She said, I got to tell you, I love that little Pentecostal church. You have to hear my aunt talk with her accent. She said, oh, Chucky, I got to tell you. I used to love to go to that little Pentecostal church. Oh, the way they worshiped there, the, the move of God there was so different 
than anything I experienced in the Baptist church. But at the same time, I was afraid of it. Because my pastor told me that was of the devil. That was all evil. It was wicked. I'm going to tell you, the devil ain't never helped nobody live right in, in, in all of eternity. He never will help anybody live right. The devil's never helped anybody live holy. And he never will help anybody to live holy. The Holy Ghost is from God. It is of God. Because when you get the Holy Ghost, honey, you're going to want to live right. You're going to want to do right. You're going to want to act right. You're going to want to be a witness and a testimony to others of the power of God and the love of God and the grace of God. Honey, the devil ain't in that business. And my little great aunt said, she said, for many, many months I went with your grandmother to this church and, and I would see the move of God. I would see people speaking in tongues and all. She said, oh, she said, it, it, it on the inside it thrilled me, on the outside it scared me. That I'd go talk to my pastor and he'd tell me, oh, that's of the devil, you know, that's not God. Blah, 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 blah. She said, finally, one day I was there in that little Pentecostal church, she said, and I began to pray and I said, Lord, see, I'm going to tell you, you start getting honest with God, God will get honest with you. Mm -hmm. When you finally get serious, when you finally decide to ask God the question, the Bible said, Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Honey, there are too many people running around acting like they already have the answers. If you already have the answers, then you never ask. If you already know where everything is found, then you never seek. If you think you've been through every door God has to open, you never knock. Until you humble yourself and say, maybe I don't have all the answer. Maybe I'm wrong on this. I don't know. Let me talk to God about it. And she said, I talked to the Lord. She said, I said, Lord, is this Holy Ghost thing real? She said, if this Holy Ghost thing is real, she said, let me hear someone speak in German that I know doesn't speak German because she spoke German. She said, Chucky, I prayed that prayer. She said, and all of a sudden, this lady in the church that I knew, she said, she's an Italian lady. She talks with an Italian accent. Her accent is so thick you can barely understand her English because of her Italian accent. She said, all of a sudden, that woman began to cry out to God and to worship God in perfect, fluent German. And my great aunt to this day in her 90s still remembers what that lady was saying in German. And she began to say it. And of course, I don't know German. But my great aunt began to say, she said, she began to say, and she's speaking in German. And tears, she's in her 90s. Tears are streaming down her face. She said, immediately God filled me with the Holy Ghost. And I too began to speak in the which one English, one German, another language that I had never learned and never known before as a physical initial evidence that I had received the Holy Ghost. God's real, folks. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God, but if you will make an effort, he will make an effort in return. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. In Romans chapter 1 verses uh, 18 through 23, the Word of God declares, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is, is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, meaning all that pertains to God. 
so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became what? Fools. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things. In that funny science tries to reduce humanity to nothing more than another species of what animal? Isn't it funny the way Paul worded this in Romans? He says, he's talking about the Romans. He said, when the Romans knew God, they didn't glorify Him as God. Well, when did they know God? When Jesus was walking the earth. He said, the invisible things of God are now made known and have now been revealed, even His eternal power and Godhead. Where was the Godhead revealed? In Jesus Christ. He said, even when they had God walking in the midst of them, they didn't recognize it. They didn't accept Him as God walking in the midst of them. They didn't thank God for this wonderful visitation and this manifestation of Himself. No. Instead, they said, oh, He's just a man. He just, just, just like every other beast of the field, just like every other animal. He's nothing more than a man. He's nothing more than a creation of God. Honey, we got pseudo-Christian cults running around trying to tell you that Jesus was nothing more than a man. He was just like the rest of the animal kingdom. There was nothing divine about him. There was nothing godly about him. He was just a man, just a creation of God. Oh, you know what my Bible calls you? A fool. You can look at Jesus and all you see is a man. You're a fool. The Word of God makes no effort whatsoever to prove that God exists. It's one of the interesting things about the Judeo-Christian faith. There's no explanation as to the origin of God. There is no explanation uh, as to how God even exists. Now, not in Judaism, which is the foundation of Christianity. In Judaism, it is simply assumed and acknowledged that God exists, period. Even His name, even His name by which He is called in Judaism, Jehovah, literally means the self-existent one. He needs no food, he needs no clothing, he, need, he needs no shelter. There is nothing you can give him that would help him to survive. How many religions in the world, ancient especially, they would feed their gods, they would leave food for their gods, they would leave offerings for their gods because their god needed to eat. Hello now. But you see, the God of the Word, the God of Scripture, the God of the Old Testament, He does not require sustenance. Right. He does not require food. There is nothing you can give Him that is going to cause Him to survive. There is nothing you can do to Him that will cause Him to cease to survive. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? Mm -hmm. In fact, from the very first verse of the Bible, there is a simple assumption made that God exists, and it asserts that He exists. The truth of God's existence need not be proven. Within humanity is the ability to believe that the divine exists, that there is more to human existence than flesh and blood, and that a spiritual plane in fact exists which human beings pass into at the moment of their death. Faith is based upon one's internal ability to believe. From the moment 
we embrace faith, God begins to interact with us and to act on our behalf. As we observe and witness the actions and the interventions of God in our lives, we then begin to see evidence of things spiritual. And our faith becomes substantiated by reason of our observable experience. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, people say, oh, you, you know, you believe that, you just believe that, you, you, just because somebody told you to believe it. Oh, honey, no I don't. I have observed God's miracles in my life. I have observed God's intervention in my life so many times that I believe it because I pray that God answers has answered prayer. I believe it because when I should have died, I lived. I believe it because when I was so sick that the doctors and the scientists had no hope for me, all it took was talking to King Jesus. And in a moment's time, in a minute's time, instantaneously, I began to recover. Don't tell me my faith is bad of empty teachings. No, my faith began simply by my acknowledging my inward ability to believe there's something more, that God exists. But then, as I begin to make steps toward God, He began to make steps toward me. And all of a sudden, God began to work on my behalf. All of a sudden, God began to intervene. All of a sudden, I began to see and experience things that showed me, I'm right here with you. I'm real, baby. Trust me, I'm right here with you. You better know I'm real. I could go down, I, if I begin to talk today about all the experiences I've had that demonstrate to me the reality of God, we'd be here for the next six months talking nonstop. A fool, however, is not one who denies simply the existence of God. A fool is one who also can acknowledge God's existence, who can even hear His Word, but does not do the things which He has been instructed to do. Oh, so church, you're not off the hook today either. Those of you Christians today, you think, well, Pastor, bless God, you're preaching to the unsaved. You're preaching to the unbeliever. You're preaching to a bunch of atheists. Oh, no, no, no. No, no, no. Don't be a fool applies as well to the Don't be a fool applies as well to the believer. Because it's not just the atheists. It's not just those who deny God and His very existence who are classified in the Word of God as fools, but also those who acknowledge God and even hear His Word. But they do not do what He has instructed them to do. Hearing the truth of God without making the effort to live it is also emblemic of a fool. In Matthew 7, 26 and 27, And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, Jesus is speaking, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. The Apostle Paul reminded us in his letter to Titus, chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates or law enforcement, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes 
foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. A fool is not only somebody who doesn't believe in God, a fool is somebody who believes in God, but doesn't do what God instructs them to do. How many believers in the church today are running around acting like fools? I can tell you from experience, too many. Amen. A fool is also one today within the church who makes no preparations. They assume everything will work out in the end and therefore they see no need to take action in the here and now as to be prepared for future necessities. This one also does not take the word of the Lord seriously. They ignore especially prophecies of Scripture and have no use for the gifts of the Spirit which would otherwise warn us at times of our need to prepare. These two hear the Lord's words, but choose not to act upon them. In Matthew 25, verses 1 through 4, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Children of fool is prepared for any eventuality. You see, this again plays into that tale of the unprofitable servant. The word of God said that he said to his master, well I know what kind of man you are and I know how you make your money and all that. So I took and buried my talent. And the master said to him, well now if you know what kind of man I am, if you know how I use my money and how I work with my money, then why did you not do that? Why didn't you invest it so like these other two men, you could bring back to me more than I gave you? You see, but this guy was satisfied to just sit on what he had. He didn't want to make any preparation. He didn't want to put forth any special effort. He didn't want to be prepared for any eventuality. Hey, listen, if I know a guy don't let his money sit around doing nothing, and he gives me money to hold for him, uh, I know pretty good and well that I probably need to do something with that money so when he comes back I can give him more than he gave me. I used to have an uncle. He's passed away now, my Uncle George. George was very, very kind to me. He was very kind to me. I could go to my Uncle George at any moment in time and ask him to borrow some money and George had hand it. He was a painter. He made really good money. He always had stacks of bills on him, you know. But I could go, and I was out of church at the time, but I could go to George and ask him for a loan, a couple hundred bucks, and he'd fork it over and never thought anything about it. My cousin told me later, he said, Dad has told me that he... He'll loan you money any day of the week. I said, really? He said that? He said, yeah. He said, you're the only one that's ever repaid him every time, all the time. He said, he, he never worries. And you know what I did when I paid my Uncle George back? I always gave him 10% more than he gave me. Did my Uncle George ask me for interest, did he ask me to give him a little? No, he never did. He was happy. Matter of fact, there were times he said to me, you don't have to do that. I said, George, when you give me your money, that's money you could have been out doing something with. That's money you could have been enjoying somewhere, doing something. I said, it's only fair. It's only right. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? But at the same time, by doing this, and I'm not saying I did it even cognitively, I didn't do it for this reason, but at the same time, I was preparing 
and laying the groundwork so that the next time I needed to borrow money, guess who George was going to be willing to lend money to? You follow what I'm saying? I'm going to tell you today, folks, a fool makes no preparations. There are a lot of people in the church today running around screaming and hollering that things are happening in the world, things are happening in America, that the Word of God has said we're going to happen. Why are you now running around like a lunatic trying to change circumstances and change things? I'll tell you why. Because you made no preparation. You didn't put any oil in your lamp. So when these prophecies came to pass, so when persecution comes against the church, you're not even remotely prepared to be able to not enter a church and worship collectively. No, we have a virus come, and look at how all these Christians scream and holler that it's persecution against the church. It's not persecution against the church, you fool. It has nothing to do with persecution against the church. The Elks Club can have their meetings. The PTA can have its meetings. Doesn't have nothing to do with persecution against the church. But you'll notice the Word of God tells us that persecution eventually is coming and that these things are going to happen. But look how people react now. Goes to show you, Tommy, are they prepared for them? No. Have they put oil in their lamp so when the bridegroom shows up they'll be able to go? No. We got too many believers in the church today acting the fool. And the Word of God tells us, don't be a fool. I'm trying to end quickly today. I know I'm running close to the end of my time. I told you before, a fool is someone who does not believe the Word of God. They don't do as God instructs them to do. But then there are those fools who do not believe the fundamentals of our faith. They do not believe the things that are essential to salvation. And yet, they still call themselves Christians. Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Well, the Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe that Jesus was revived. They don't believe that his physical body once again was, had life breathed into it and that a dead body which had laid dead for three days suddenly was reanimated and brought back to life and restored. They don't believe that. Now talk to them, folks. Before you let them in your door, Figure out what they teach, preach, and believe. They'll tell you, oh no, his body evaporated. It just disappeared. And he emerged from the tomb with a whole brand new manifestation of a body that God had given him. It wasn't the same body. Oh, no, 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 no. Well, honey, i got news for you. You just denied an essential truth to salvation. There is no way in hell or heaven either one you're going to be saved believing what you just said. I'm sorry to tell you that, but that's the truth. I'm going to explain it to you in a minute. You're denying one of the most fundamental truths of our faith. You can't be saved without acknowledging and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Oh, but our explanation is God, quote unquote, raising him from the dead. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's not, it's not what the Bible describes as his having been raised from the dead. In Luke chapter 24, verses 22 through 26, Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher, 
And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the woman, women had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Rather than anticipate the Lord's resurrection, the apostles of Jesus Christ were astonished by it. All the Lord and the prophets had said concerning his rising from the dead, they disbelieved. I remember a Jewish rabbi many years ago in Brooklyn, New York. People in the Hasidic community, the Hasidic Jewish community, were touting him as the Messiah. Tommy, I remember one day being at work in Manhattan, and there were these kind of looked like parade floats. Three great big trucks come down the road with trailers and all this fancy stuff on them, you know. And they were honking horns and all these Hasidic Jews were driving cars and honking horns and some of them were in the streets waving their arms and shouting and screaming and hollering and making all kind of noise. And you look and it had a big old picture of this old Hasidic rabbi declaring him to be the Messiah. When the old timer fell sick and he wound up in the hospital in Brooklyn, you'd have thought that all those people would have been home hiding their faces saying, oh boy, did we goof. No. They were in the streets outside of the hospital dancing and celebrating because they said, our Messiah must die and rise again. Isn't it funny the apostles of Jesus weren't dancing and singing in the streets waiting for him to rise again? He had said he would rise again. Did they believe him? No. The prophets of old had said that Messiah must die and rise again. Did they believe him? No. There are Christians today who still don't believe Jesus died and physically rose from the dead. Or people who call themselves Christians. They don't believe the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 35-38 But some men will say, Paul writes to the church at Corinth, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Now this is answering Jehovah's Witness theology right here. Because they say he rose in a different body, that it was an entirely different body. Paul said, some men will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Listen. Thou fool! That which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be but bear grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. When you plant a seed, After a few weeks, as that little sprout begins to grow up out of the ground, is that plant growing up out of the ground, Tommy, completely separate from that seed? Is it something entirely different? Did you bury that seed and then miraculously something different and new began to emerge? No. The seed gave birth to the plant. The human body, Paul says, 
this body gives birth to another body. This body gives birth to a spiritual body. How do we rise from the dead? Because this body gives birth to us to another body. But the reality is Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He physically emerged from the tomb. He did not commit a fraud upon his disciples and the apostles, which it would have been a fraud if he said all this time, I'm going to rise from the dead. I'm going to rise from the dead. I'm going to rise from the dead. Then he turns around and God causes the body to disappear and evaporate. And all of a sudden, he comes out a whole new different person, a whole new different uh, you know, manifestation of himself. Listen to what the Word of God tells us. A fool is one who denies the physical resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul called believers fools who could not grasp the simple concept that what today is manifested physically is merely a seed of what will manifest tomorrow spiritually. The plant is not separate or different from the seed but rather is born from the seed and a new different manifestation of all that was contained within the seed. So it is with our resurrection. The spirit of man does not merely emerge from the body, but the body itself is transformed and takes upon itself a new and glorious form. The body itself transforms. Jesus hadn't transformed yet because he told Mary, touch me not, I have not yet ascended unto the Father. He hadn't transformed yet. He hadn't changed his, he was very much physical at that moment in time. He was very much, he wasn't walking through walls, he wasn't appearing to his disciples as yet. Listen, 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 53. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. In Acts 10.41, not to all the people, Paul speaks of the fact that uh, uh, the Word of God speaks of the fact that Jesus appeared to many people, many witnesses after He rose from the dead. He said, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before God, even to us who did eat and drink with Him after He rose from the dead. The fact that He ate and drank with them they counted as evidence that he was indeed the physical Jesus that they had buried. When he was trying to prove to them that he had physically risen from the dead, he said, bring me food. Hey, you got fish there, you got bread there, give me some of that. Because that would be evidence to them that he had physically risen from the dead. Romans 10 verse 9, again I repeat that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. What occurred in that tomb was miraculous. What occurred in that tomb was supernatural. What occurred in that tomb could only occur because the divine had occupied the human. Mm -hmm. He was raised, the Word of God said, by the power of God. Lastly today, trying to hurry, a fool puts his confidence in his possessions and takes tomorrow for granted. In Luke chapter 12, verses 15 through 20, And he said unto them, Take 
take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The crown of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thy knees, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? You see, a fool thinks that his confidence can safely rest in his possessions. A fool thinks that, well, I've made preparation. I've got savings. I've got uh, something set aside. I've got life insurance. I've got this insurance. I've got that. You know, I've got this put away. I own this. I own that. And they put their confidence in their possessions. They put their confidence in those things which they have uh, prepared for themselves for the future. They take tomorrow for granted. I will tell you, there are too many Christians in the world today who act just like this. 1 Timothy 6, verses 3 through 11, my last passage. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of, of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Mm -hmm. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and to snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, Love, patience, meekness. A fool today I've shared with you is defined as one who denies the existence of God. A fool is one who acknowledges God, but who does not strive to live according to the Lord's teachings. A fool is one who believes the pro who, who disbelieves the prophecies of Scripture and the counsel of the Spirit? A fool is one who denies the physical resurrection, be it the Lord's or our own. And a fool is one who trusts in possessions and takes tomorrow for granted. I have some advice for you this afternoon. And that advice simply is this. Don't be a fool. Amen. Amen.